Welcome back everyone to another installment of Space This Week, a video series in which every single Monday I recap all the news from the past week about Starship development, all of the space launches we saw and all the other interesting news stories from the world of spaceflight. We once again have so much to cover so let's get right into things, kicking this party off once again with Starship development updates. <laughs> There is once again so much to talk about with the development of this absolutely insane project that SpaceX are undertaking. Ship 24's aft section was rolled out of Tent 3 on Monday, sporting a very nice and clean tile job with what appears to be the liquid oxygen downcomer tube poking out of the top. It was temporarily mated to the top section of Booster 8 to ensure that it fit okay. And speaking of Booster 8, construction is coming along very well and very fast, and I expect it won't be very long before we see the booster fully stacked. Anyway, back to Ship 24. Its nose cone was transferred to the high bay as well, so hopefully we should see its major sections begin getting joined this week, hopefully with full stacking following not too long after. The completion of Ship 24 will be a significant one. This will not only likely be the first orbital class starship that will be flown by SpaceX, but it'll also be the first payload capable starship as well, as this is sporting the cargo hatch that we've spotted at the build site. It's the hatch that we think will deploy payload in a similar fashion to a giant Pez dispenser. <laughs> Therefore, if the test flight of this ship goes well, it'll not only be a huge achievement for the Starship program, but also for the Starlink mission as well. Starlink V2 is crucial for SpaceX, and only Starship can launch these payloads. Falcon-class rockets are simply not good enough. The current leading expectation for the Orbital Flight Test's booster that will carry Ship 24 on its historic orbital mission will be booster number 7. It was placed on the orbital launch mount last week, and SpaceX then subjected it to a cryoproofing test using liquid nitrogen. This is, of course, the first time that we've seen a 33 Raptor engine booster undergo cryo testing. Admittedly, though, we are still waiting for the Raptors to be fitted. <laughs> this was also the first time that SpaceX have filled an entire Super Heavy to full capacity. Both the liquid methane and oxygen tanks were completely filled to the brim, something we've never seen before. And that's really impressive. With Booster 4, SpaceX performed several cryo tests where they steadily increased the amount of cryogenic liquid being loaded in in fairly small increments, but they never actually fully loaded it. But now, Booster 7 had yet to undergo any real tests at all before SpaceX immediately filled it to the brim in just two hours without any obvious holds during the procedure. I guess they really are diving headfirst into meeting Elon Musk's hope that the orbital launch attempt can happen in May. But then, of course, that is also heavily reliant on the FAA granting approval. Another reminder of how fast SpaceX have been moving with the Starship program was this post shared by CU Nunes Images last week. This photo was taken exactly a year ago on Tuesday, and it's the orbital launch pad. At the time, just six stumps in the ground. And then, here we are today! The pad is complete, along with the gigantic tower and ridiculous but incredible catch arm system, and of course we had a completed flight ready booster and starship stack very recently. Although of course both ship and booster have now been relegated to ground tests only, in light of all the new design improvements to newer vehicles, most notably of which being the transition from Raptor 1 to Raptor 2. Now it's all eyes on booster 7. After its time on the pad, it was lifted off and placed onto the can crusher rig. This device is designed to test the stress that max Q would induce on a booster in flight and works by pulling down from the top of the booster via all of these cables here. It'll be interesting to see if SpaceX follows through with this structural test for Booster 7, or if we'll have any more surprises in store, like more cryoproofing tests, or possibly the fitting of some engines, as we've started seeing the first production Raptor 2s arriving at the Starbase site. By the way guys, I just gotta shamelessly ask right now that if you are enjoying this video, then do consider leaving a like down below, as it does really help support what I do here. Anyway, moving along, Starships and Super Heavies aside, there's a lot of big changes happening with the supporting infrastructure as well. SpaceX are making some big changes to the launch tower in preparation for the new generation of Starship vehicles. The Quick Disconnect Arms umbilical arm, which is used to transfer fuel to the Starship upper stage, was removed on Tuesday, presumably so that it can be modified to accommodate changes to the connection points on Ship 24 and beyond. The Wide Bay also continues to grow. We're not seeing as many dramatic visible changes to it as we were when SpaceX were erecting the walls of the building, but they're still hard at work adding all the innards to the structure. SpaceX have installed its gantry crane, 
and interestingly, one of them is sporting a very classy moustache. <laughs> now, on Sunday, so just too late for me to catch and cover in last Monday's episode of Space This Week, NASA shared footage of Mark Van Tye's arrival at Houston in a sleek private jet after returning to Earth aboard Soyuz MS-19, along with Roscosmos cosmonauts Anton Skleplerov and Pyotr Dubrov. His return to Earth marks a new record for American astronauts. After 355 consecutive days in space, he now holds the record for longest American spaceflight. NASA's shared some highlight clips of his stay aboard the ISS. And really, I for one struggle to imagine myself being able to cut it. Staying aboard a relatively small indoor space for such an extended period of time, entirely isolated from family and friends, and in such an outright hostile environment. I mean, I hate the claustrophobia of being stuck in my car in rush hour. It's a big reason I cycle to work actually, so I can't imagine the strength it must take to live in the International Space Station for such an extended period of time. At least you would have the company of fellow humans to spur you on, and of course, knowing you have the support of all of us plebeians down on Earth. We have some new footage from NASA's Perseverance rover. The rover captured some sound recordings from the Martian surface, which included some puffs and pings from one of its tools. Some light Martian wind. The whirring of the agency's Ingenuity Mars helicopter. And some laser zaps. All the sounds you hopefully just heard, headphones are recommended, were recorded using the microphone belonging to the Perseverance's Supercam instrument, mounted on the head of the rover's mast. Other sounds, including the puffs and pings from the rover's gaseous dust removal tool blowing shavings off rock faces, were recorded by another microphone mounted on the chassis of the rover. This audio, and other generated samples, paved the way for a new study based on recordings made by the rover, which revealed that the speed of sound is slower on Mars than on Earth, and that, mostly, a deep silence prevails in the much thinner atmosphere. The most notable launch we saw, in my humble opinion, last week, was the Falcon 9 Axiom Mission 1, which launched from the launch pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center. This is an entirely private crew mission to the International Space Station, operated by Axiom Space. The crew flew aboard a Crew Dragon, and they consist of Michael Lope Alegria, a professionally trained NASA astronaut employed by Axiom Space, Ethan Stipp from Israel, Larry Connor from the United States, and Mark Pathy from Canada. The Crew Dragon itself is Crew Dragon Endeavour, which previously supported the Demo 2 and Crew 2 SpaceX missions. You can see from Rookland's latest infographic here that this flight places the Endeavour crew capsule into the number one spot for the most number of flights, with Crew Dragon and resilience not too far behind. The first stage booster for this flight managed to successfully land on the drone ship a shortfall of Gravitas shortly after liftoff, wrapping up this booster's fifth overall flight. A fantastic aspect to this particular booster landing is that, for once, the livestream cameras didn't really cut out at all, and we got a basically completely uninterrupted view of the booster landing from both the perspective of the drone ship and from the top of the rocket itself. Axiom 1 is a notable mission for sure. For starters, this is the first ever all-private crew launch to the International Space Station, and they'll be spending a total of roughly 8 days aboard the station during which they'll conduct a total of 25 scientific experiments, which will take a cumulative 100 hours to complete. It's not fully known how much the three paying customers were charged for their seats on this flight, but media reports have suggested that they paid $55 million each, and NASA has stated that their use of the station's life support systems and toilets would cost just over $11,000 per person. Do you think that, upon their return, the three customers of Axiom 1 should be considered astronauts? While they've not been subjected to the intense training that NASA astronauts typically undergo. They aren't just stargazing up there, they're actively performing scientific experiments, and they're spending a significant amount of time in space. What do you think? I think it's fair to say that guests of New Shepard and VSS Unity aren't really astronauts, but this time I feel like the area is a little more grey. Personally, I'd lean more towards saying that they are astronauts, but I'd love to hear what you think. Let me know in the comments down below. We had a launch from China on Wednesday. This was a Long March 4C, carrying a single GFN-303 satellite to low Earth orbit. The GFN satellites are operated by the Chinese Ministry of Natural Resources, and they're a series of high-resolution Earth imaging satellites for the state-sponsored program China High Resolution Earth Observation System. Last week's launch was a success, and this latest 
Skafen satellite is now operational. Last week, Russia launched a Soyuz rocket on the 7th of April, which deployed a signals intelligence satellite to low Earth orbit. And that'll be the extent of my Russian launch coverage this week. Now, I'll show you this footage instead. It's a video my cousin took watching the Axiom 1 launch on Friday. Not the greatest quality footage, I admit, it was recorded on a phone, but it'll provide excellent background footage while I give a big thanks to all my amazing Patreon supporters and channel members whose names are now on screen and who together make all this content possible. These videos do cost time and money to make, and so it's thanks to their generosity that I'm able to produce this content for you all. If you want to join, you can sign up via the on-screen and description link otherwise there are two video suggestions on screen from my channel hopefully they look interesting to you don't forget to like and subscribe thanks for flying with me today and i'll see you all next time